Welcome to Frank's Day Unexplains and to the formal languages part of the discrete mathematics course at Cambridge. Having introduced formal languages, rule induction and regular expressions, I'm now going to ask you four non-trivial questions that will guide us through the rest of this course. Try and figure them out for yourselves before I reveal the answer in the lectures. If you do that, your understanding of the topic will be so much deeper. We begin today's video by observing that a regular expression defines a formal language, the language of all and only the strings that match that regular expression. And to do that, we must define formally what we mean by matching, which is what we're going to do today. If you like these explanations, please click the like button to say so. And if you don't, please tell me why in the comments so that I may improve them in the future. We are using these inductive proofs in several ways and what it says here what it says here is this relation this twiddle thing between strings which are the concrete syntax for regular expression on the left and the trees which are the abstract uh, syntax for the regular expressions on the right and the axioms say uh, the um, the single symbol A for every A in the alphabet sigma uh, corresponds to the, the abstract syntax tree that is only made of one terminal with this shape, this uh, call it functor symbol for A, and there's one for every symbol. The, um, the symbol, this funny epsilon, in the context of regular expressions as concrete syntax for this regular expression matches the abstract syntax tree of this other uh, nullary operator null. And this uh, other symbol of empty set matches this um, other nullary operator of empty. Then the rules say if there is a concrete syntax R which matches the abstract syntax, abstract syntax tree R, then the concrete syntax string obtained by wrapping parentheses around this also matches the same tree R. If there is a syntax, if there is a string R, which is a concrete syntax for some regular expression, which matches the tree R, and there is another string that matches another tree S, then the regular expression, the, the concrete syntax obtained by concatenating them with a vertical bar matches, well, matches, is related to, with this twiddle, to the tree that is obtained by applying this union operator to the two trees that I had over here. This doesn't say anything about um, what strings the regular expressions matches. It just gives you rules for matching regular expression, and I hesitate to say strings, I mean, strings over the alphabet sigma plus the meta symbols that represent the concrete syntax for regular expressions matches those two trees, which are the abstract uh, syntax for the same regular expressions. So here we see examples of things that match, and we can see, I said some of you sh who are still awake should be upset at the fact that this concrete syntax matches two rather different trees, which would have rather different interpretations. So in this case, I am first concatenating the A and the star of B. So I'm, I'm doing first this thing, and then I'm doing the union or with null of this thing. That seems all right, but this one should seem not all right because what I'm doing is first I am doing the union of this epsilon and A, so first I'm doing this, then I'm doing the star of B, and then I'm concatenating this and this. And so this syntax is related to both this and this, and this one feels wrong. Why does it feel wrong? Because we have it in our mind that there's a precedence between those operators. That the first thing is you apply the star, that's the one that binds the tightest, uh, then you apply the concatenation, and then at the end of that you apply 
the bar. And that's what you have done in this one. That's clearly not what you have done in here, because you have applied the uh, concatenation after having applied the, um, the union between those two. So, but unless we say so, it is not so. So only after we say, and we will say this in, in the next slide, I think. Yes, we say it uh, over here. We um, decree that the star operator binds more tightly than the concatenation operator, which in turn binds more tightly than the alternation operator. Until we say so, then all these things are valid. After we say so, then there's only one way to interpret this, uh, this concrete syntax, which is the abstract syntax that we actually liked, and we can delete the one that we didn't like. But we have to say that explicitly first. It's not part of what the induction rules told us. Another remark in here is that um, there's ambiguity on which order to apply various concatenations in. And this order is disambiguated by the rule that uh, we start applying them from the left. Uh, but this is less crucial than this other case because the semantics are such that if you, if you violate this decree, you get different behavior. But if you violate this other decree, you get a different order in which to do uh, your concatenations. But because concatenation is inherently associative, then you get the same result. So it's not so bad. But anyway, from this slide onwards, we are going to uh, rely on these assumptions. We decree that there's a precedence between the operators. We decree that there's a left associativity for uh, concatenation and union, and therefore we are free to take just the concrete syntax as a representation for the abstract syntax because there is now a unique correspondence, which there wasn't until this slide. So we are now free to refer to regular expressions using the concrete syntax. So the whole point of regular expressions is to match strings and this is what you have used. The majority of you who have already used regular expressions have used them to identify classes of strings. Uh, but the point of this course is not so much to teach you how to use regular expressions. It's more about reasoning about all the things you can do with regular expressions uh, and the power, the expressive power that regular expressions have. Uh, and the art of building regular expressions that match specific things is assumed to be an easy thing that you either already know or you can easily pick out uh, on your own. So there's just going to be a couple of examples, but not a whole uh, lecture on matching strings, which is actually very easy. So for the, for the few of you who have not encountered regular expression before, this is the page where we actually define the semantics, whereas up to now we were defining the syntax. And so what do these operators of regular expressions actually mean? If you have um, a regular expression u, no, this is a, a string u, u is a variable over the strings, uh, then this string matches the regular expression a, where a is one of the symbols in the alphabet, if and only if uh, the string is equal to that symbol. That's trivial. It matches the regular expression funny epsilon if and only if uh, u is the empty string, uh, which is this uh, original epsilon, which has a slightly different shape, uh, which clearly is not a symbol in our alphabet. It's a meta symbol there as well. There is no string that matches the regular expression this other empty set type of symbol. This is something that you use when you want to build a regular expression that does not match any string, which you would otherwise have no way of expressing with the other operators. The string u matches a regular expression made like this by a vertical bar between two other regular expressions, if and only if it either matches r or it matches s. If instead you string the two component regular expressions together without any intervening symbol, then this means the concatenation means your u matches that if and only if you can split 
u into two parts where the first part matches r and the second part matches s. And then the star operator, which means zero more times, u matches r star if and only if it matches regular expression r zero times, or one time, or two times, or three times, or however many uh, finite number of times you like. So uh, u can be the empty string if it matches it zero times, uh, or it just matches r, or it can be expressed a concatenation of two or more strings, each of which matches r. Two or more strings, two or three or four or five, or however many you want. So this is now recycling our tool of inductive definition for yet another purpose uh, and for defining how matching between strings and uh, regular expression concrete syntax works. So on the left, I have a string over, uh, over my alphabet sigma. And on the right, I have the concrete syntax for a regular expression over the uh, alphabet sigma plus the meta symbols, the six meta symbols that you're not familiar with. And so the axioms are that every symbol matches a regular expression made of that symbol. The empty string matches the symbol for the empty string. Uh, and the empty string also matches any starred version of a regular expression because it just takes it zero times. And the rules, by now what you would expect, uh, if string u matches regular expression R, then U also matches regular expression with R or another regular expression S, uh, and the same on the other side. And here, if uh, string V matches R and string W matches regular expression S, then the concatenation of the strings matches the concatenation of the regular expressions. And here we have the uh, definition of the other cases for R. If u matches r and v matches r star. You can see a uh, recursive way of defining this uh, as opposed to the iterative way of the previous slide. Then the concatenation of u and v matches r star as well. So here are a few examples you could, uh, you could try by taking a piece of paper and uh, covering up this part and see if what you come up with is the same as what you get when you uncover. Uh, a or B, since the alphabet is only A and B, is matched by uh, each of the symbols in sigma. Uh, B brackets A or B star, the star binds to the brackets, uh, is matched by any string that begins with a B and then continues with uh, an A or a B repeated zero more times, which means with anything. So B followed by anything. Uh, this thing here is the star applied to this big bracket. So I can repeat the inside of this as many times as I like. And the inside is either A or B followed by either A or B. So it looks like it's basically anything. But there's a constraint that I have to have. The thing that's repeated must be made of two symbols, either A or B, other A or B. So this turns out to be all the strings with an even uh, number of symbols. Now, I have to ask you something. I am really curious about this, because I was really cross between puzzled and upset at what happened last year. I set an exam question, and the results were, uh, let's say, surprising, to say the least. It highlighted that. Maybe I should, just, I should just ask you the question, although having led you to this, I hope that all of you will answer the same thing. Um, do you think zero is even? If you think so, raise your hand. Do you think zero is not even? If you think so, then raise your hand. OK, there's a few. Well, there were quite a few more who believed that zero was not even. And this is deeply upsetting for me. Um, zero, poor zero, is a number. It's the most basic number you can have. You can make all the other numbers out of zero just take, taking the successor. Peana would be rolling his grave hearing that people think that zero is not a decent number. Of course it's a number. It's a fine number. It's a great number. 
and like all the other integers, it's either even or odd. So those people who think that the zero is not even, do they think it's odd? Zero, of course it's even. Zero is a number, it's fine, and it's even. Uh, and so strings of even length include the string of length zero, which is even, because you just take zero times the thing in this bracket. Anyway, um, I will not be asking the same question, but if I were to ask it in this year's exam, I hope that all of you would be convinced that zero is even, poor zero. So mistreated. Okay, uh, this other thing has uh, something similar to this. You can choose either A or B as many times as you like, and then uh, either A or B as many times as you like. Uh, does this also mean it has to be of even length? No, because as many times as you like includes zero times, but also includes one time. And this one, you can take this one one time, this one zero times, and you can get uh, any length you like. So this is basically no different from just having the same without the second set uh, a bracket here. This other one, you have the empty string or A, the empty string or B. So this part here before the alternation could be matched by the empty string if that's what you choose both times, or A, or B, or A followed by B. Uh, and you can have any of these choices or also BB. So these are the things that come out of this. And this one, you have two choices. Either you match uh, this empty set symbol and B, but the empty set doesn't match anything. So concatenating something that doesn't match anything with B, you're not going to get any matches anyway. So there's no way to satisfy this. Uh, or A, and then A is just matched by A. That's how these examples work. Um, if you are new to regular expression, but even if you're not, it would be a good idea to try something else. So let's consider your CRS ID. OK, my CRS ID is uh, FMS27. <coughs> All CRS IDs are made of uh, a bunch of letters coming from your initials and a bunch of numbers coming from God knows where. So if we take the simplified view of the world that a CRS ID is a bunch of letters followed by a bunch of digits, then can we build the regular expression for that? It's not exactly the definition of CRS ID, but close enough for now. So to make a regular expression that recognizes a single letter, what would I do? I, I'll call it L, regular expression L. with the syntax we cited so far, it's very easy. I just take, it's either A, or it's B, or it's C, or it's Z. Uh, to make one that recognizes a digit is a similar job. It's either zero, or one, or two, or nine. And then to make one that uh, recognizes a bunch of letters followed by a bunch of digits, uh, my first attempt at making CRS ID. Could this be letter star digit star? Are you happy with that? I take this as many times as I like. No, because. We have to have at least one letter and at least one digit, that's correct. So this star would allow me to take as many times as I like, including zero times. So uh, I would end up with, for example, 27, which is not a valid CRS ID. I would end up with an empty string, which is an even less valid CRS ID. So I must take as many times as I like, so long as there's at least one. And what do I do? Is there uh, any other syntax than the star? Well, in some regular expression, uh, things that you may have seen in your tool, there's a plus instead of a star that says at least one, and then as many as you like. But we don't have that luxury. We just have the star. So what do I do? It's not difficult. Hold it very shy. Uh, you can just put one in front, and then say there's at least one, and then as many as you like, including zero. But you have at least one in the bag, because that's uh, guaranteed by this first part. And then the same treatment for this. And you do that. Uh, and I leave you to write one where we say, well, actually, uh, yes. uh, 
This one would be a valid CRS ID according to this definition, but I'm sure it would never be assigned because they would consider it's too long. So uh, can you do a definition where this part is at most uh, four letters long and this part is at most four digits long, for example? Can you build a regular expression to do that? Please do that uh, in the margin of your handout. So this is, again, something I have to shrink. This is um, a bit like what I said at the start of the algorithms course. I started asking you some questions. Here are some questions. Think about those things. They're not, not that easy. But if you follow through all the rest of my lectures, you will get an answer to each of them. Is there an algorithm which, given a string u and the regular expression r, computes whether or not the string matches the regular expression. Well, I bet you there exists, because otherwise, how would all these tools work? Uh, but what is it? How could you do it? I mean, you know what the regular expressions do. Uh, can you come up with an algorithm? That's not so easy, but we will describe one. The algorithm will be based on building a machine, a robot, an automaton, and feeding the string to the automaton. That's what it eats. And it will then either light up uh, its green light that says, yes, it matches, or not, in which case it doesn't match. Second question, in formulating the definition of regular expressions, have we missed out on some practically useful notions of pattern? Yes, clearly, because we couldn't say uh, at least one letter and we, the plus thing that is uh, used in uh, regular expressions used in real life. Uh, are uh, very uh, Spartan version of regular expression, didn't have the plus. So we have missed, us, missed out on something that is practically useful. Uh, but actually, we haven't missed out on very much because we could express it in terms of the primitives we had. So there are a bunch of things that are used in the syntax of regular expressions used in practical tools which make your life easier. For example, when I wrote the regular expression for the letters A or B or C or D and so on, there is a shorthand for that in a regular expression where you put a square bracket and then you write A minus Z, and that means the range from A to Z. Uh, and all these things, we haven't defined rules or syntax for that, uh, but we can always reconstruct them out of the primitives we had. So in that sense, what we've given is a base out of which other things that depend on them can also be done, and they're just convenience or syntactic sugar, but you're not missing out on things that uh, you would not otherwise be able to express with the primitives I have already given. So we've missed out on some, some things that is practical, but we can always reconstruct. Question C, is there an algorithm which given two regular expressions, and, and so, and I'm, it sounds like I'm already answering my own question, but actually there's lots of subtleties to uh, explore here to do with um, other things such as finding the regular expression that is the complement of another regular expression. So the regular expression that matches all the strings in the alphabet that are not matched by a given regular expression. We have not given syntax for that. Uh, it is possible to derive this from the things we have done. It's not at all trivial and it will take a while to get, it will take a while for us to get to the stage where we can say how this is done. Question C, is there an algorithm which given Two regular expressions, R and S, computes whether or not they are equivalent. This is something that is quite difficult to do by eye. If I come up with a regular expression, you come up with a regular expression, and if I made the mistake of setting that as an exam question and saying, please build the regular expression to recognize <laughs> strings that contain three A's, and you come up with a regular expression that doesn't look anything like mine, then I have to figure out to award you your marks, are these two regular expressions equivalent? And this is uh, not an easy thing to do, but we will uh, eventually get to an algorithm that does that. It's an algorithm that's so complicated, it's, it's not the one that I'm going to use in my head, uh, but there is an algorithm that consistently works all the time to solve this problem. And then is every language, so every subset of sigma star of the form LR for some R, in other words, is it the case that for every possible subset of the strings on my alphabet, I can 
generate a regular expression that matches exactly only the strings of the language? And the answer to that is a resounding no. Uh, and the reason for that, you can already uh, reach on your own right now using a counting argument. So the counting argument is how many elements are there in the set of all languages over sigma? The set of all languages over sigma is the set of all subsets of sigma star. Sigma star is the set of all strings over sigma of any length, any finite length. Uh, and how many, how many strings are there over sigma? An infinite number, clearly, but how infinite? Is this a countably infinite or uncountably infinite number of strings over the alphabet sigma? Can I count them? Does it mean, it means, can I put them in a bijection? Remember the bijections, the little song and so on, uh, aubergines. Can you put the strings in a bijection with the natural numbers? Yes, it is very easy. You just start by ordering them by length. You start with the one of zero length, you call that number zero. Then the ones of length one, there's as many as there are symbols in your alphabet, and you call them one, two, three, four, five. When you run out of them, you do the ones of length two. You sort them in alphabetical order, and so they are ordered, and you number all the ones of length two with the next numbers you have, then all the ones of length three, and all the ones of length four. And you can have a bijection where every string in the language is assigned a natural number. So this is a countable set. However, the set of all subsets of this set of strings is also an infinite set, but is it countable? Well, unfortunately, it is not countable. Uh, with an argument that uh, was made by Cantor and that I hope you have already seen. Have you seen it? A small minority of you are nodding. The other ones hoped that they could get away with having passed that part of the course. Uh, it's, actually, uh, it's actually good fun, but I'm already halfway through, so I shouldn't be uh, digressing and playing with Cantor. So I'll leave you to go back and revise Cantor and make sure you are convinced that the power set of uh, an infinitely countable set is not itself countable. And so this means because the number of regular expressions is bounded by the number of strings that you can make over the alphabet uh, sigma plus the meta symbols, then that's a countable number of regular expressions. And if there is an uncountable number of languages, then there are not enough regular expressions to describe all possible languages. So the answer to this is no. Uh, and we will also see that it's not just because of all the um, totally picking strings at random type of languages of which clearly there's very, very many that there's too many um, to describe with regular expression. There are also some that are very easy to express in some form, uh, even using a rule induction. So in a compact description of the language, you can say, what all the strings are, but there's no regular expression that does that. And we will see some of that uh, in relation to the property of regular languages called the pumping lemma.